Welcome everyone, Questine here to talk about the best legend lords of every race. With the dwarves, we have Grumbrindle. His faction effects include an evasion chance when using the underway plus 60%, 20% weapon strength when fighting against elves, he really dislikes the elves, and can call upon the power of the ancestor gods. Now, the ancestor gods give you various different benefits, like a significant benefit to Grumbrindle's own fighting prowess or an army benefit an upkeep and research benefit, or Valeas Protection, which is the one I like because it gives you 20% casualty replenishment and 10 control for Grumbrindle, basically wherever Grumbrindle is. Now, 20% casualty replenishment goes a long way towards making up for one of the major issues that the dwarves do have. And that issue is, simply put, poor casualty replenishment. But Grumbrindle goes even further in this respect. He gets the White Dwarf effect, which gives melee defense for Quarlers and Iron Drakes, as well as leadership benefit for his own army. So that means Quarlers will be fairly close in terms of melee ability to Dwarf Warriors. Though right now Dwarf Warriors have gained a sh Silver Shield, so they are better against range, though Quarlers being a ranged unit that's pretty solid will do uh, obviously their own part. Grumbrindle's true faction effects, however, don't stop there because he gets a special blue skill line that is the best in the game. And I don't think any other legendary lord in the game does so much for his faction as Grumbrindle does. He gets a plus three recruit rank for all armies faction wide, plus 15% recruit cost, 15% campaign movement reach for all characters, that's one of the highest in the game by the way, if not the highest in the game, 6% casualty replenishment and one global recruit capacity. Then he actually gets his special skill line, which gives him a further 15% movement range, melee defense and armor piercing when defending, vigor loss reduction minus 50%, benefits to iron drakes and war machine units, Grimnir's resolve, which gives, uh, which gives him more ability uh, uses for Grumbrindle has no fear and a cooldown reduction, age of vengeance for speed and armor piercing. Yeah, talk about speed when we're talking about slayers, Ungram. And then a cooldown reduction for Time of Ancestors, which is not really too significant. He also has four quest uh, battles, so that means he can gain a lot of money. Grumbrindle is great. He takes a lot of the weaknesses that the dwarves have, like their poor casualty replenishment, and makes up for it. Now, it's not perfect. He's still a dwarf legendary lord, and dwarves do suck but he certainly is the most powerful. His grudges are pretty straightforward too, because two of them are basically bully Malekith, more or less. If there is a downside in Grumbrindle's campaign, it's the following. He starts very far away from the other dwarves, and you're not really gonna make your way there. So you're basically playing a campaign with just him. My personal advice would be this. If you're playing a dwarf campaign right now in Warhammer 3, you probably want to use some mods to make it playable. And you're probably better off to get the Defeat the Legendary Lords mod and play as Forgrim. That would be the best campaign. But the best Legendary Lord, yes, by far Grumbrindle. He's great to play himself. He's great to confederate if you can manage that, of course. You can manage it with the mod because Grumbrindle generally will lose to Malak if you're playing a Legendary very hard. So you should be able... Uh, to get them if you're using that particular mod as Forgrim or Belagar or Forek. An alternative though on this list would be Forgrim. Uh, Forek himself can also stand pretty solidly, though the problem for Forek isn't his faction effects, it's his starting position and the way his campaign is structured. But Grumbrindle has probably the easiest Dwarven campaign, the most amount of strength of any Dwarf, at least early on, though not necessarily later on, because without the landmarks and the Dwarven lands, without confederating other Legendary Lords, obviously he's going to be a bit more limited. But still, a great deal of power. Like, if you're just starting, if you just want to pick up the Dwarves and start playing them, Grombrindle is the choice. For the Empire, it would be Marcus Wolfhard. Now, I know what you're gonna say, Volkmar can become stronger. That is true. If you endure Volkmar's campaign, he certainly can become stronger, far stronger. But Marcus Wolfhart, although he has a miserable campaign, all Imperial campaigns are miserable in one way or another. It's a broken race, the campaigns aren't all uh, very well designed, any of them, not even Volkmar, they're all pretty awful. 
But here's the thing about Marcus Wolfhart. He certainly makes up for many of the deficiencies that the Empire has, even if he has some pretty bad mechanics himself. So, faction-wide effects, really, the only things that matter are the fact that he gets plus three recruit rank for Huntsman General, and his diplomatic relations are severely affected with Lizardmen. So he's going to be at war with Lizardmen. On top of that, he can get reinforcements from the Empire, but he will uh, have a hostility meter that will affect his campaign in a pretty substantial way. Well, let's uh, talk about this, because this um, hostility meter is going to be so important. Here's what you need to know. As you wage war on Lustra, as you take territory, you're building, a cl uh, you're building up hostility. Now, when, um, when you start building up a hostility, what's going to end up happening is that you're going to get Imperial supplies eventually, very, very quickly. Now, Imperial supplies are the key here, because what they give Marcus Wolfarth is a lot of power. Like, once you get to Imperial Guardians, you're starting, you're, you're looking at getting artillery. You're starting to get really good units. You can get some of the higher tier units, like Hellstorm rocket batteries, cannons, great swords, huntsmen, very early on in this campaign. That means you get a lot of early game power. And the reason this is important in Imperial campaign is the Imperial early game roster just sucks. Plain, plain and simple. Like hunt, uh, archers, spearmen, swordsmen, um, free company militia, crossbowmen, halberdiers, spearmen with shields, they all are terrible. The only units that are good, uh, the only units that are good in the Imperial roster are basically the units you start getting from tier 3 and tier 4 with artillery specifically. I mean, there are, of course, Pistolier and Imperial Knights. They're pretty good. Like, the cavalry side of the Empire is a good part. But when we're thinking about infantry or artillery, yeah, you want to get to Tier 3 or Tier 4, really. So being able to get units that are Tier 3 or Tier 4 or even higher very early in a campaign genuinely helps out his campaign in a very substantial manner. Now, the downside of this is that you're going to have to deal with a Lizardman Doomstack now and then as you... Uh, increase the hostility meter and you're basically going to suffer a great deal of control issues in your campaign though the empire has certainly the ability of keeping control in check uh, because you can get uh, the tap room into uh, the tavern so you shouldn't have too many control issues i do think that he should start with a higher level city like most fashions that start with the with the minor settlement started with it at tier two on the hunt but Marcus Wolfhard certainly has a great deal of power in his campaign. Now, looking at his Lord effects, he's getting upkeep for archers and huntsmen. So you can really make a fairly cheap army of huntsmen. Because huntsmen are the main range unit of the Empire. You shouldn't use handgunners because handgunners are, well, crap because they're gunpowder units. Like the regiments are now short. That's a different, uh, different discussion. Now, when we're looking at a special skill line, you're getting recruit rank. Um, missile resistance, campaign movement range, casualty replenishment, which is always nice to have, more upkeep for huntsmen and archers, so you're looking at minus 65% upkeep benefit, uh, and you also get woodsmen, so they can move for trees, uh, he gets double shot uh, ammunition, so ammunition extra projectiles for huntsmen units, uh, he gets sundering attacks, and he gets vanguard deployment for his entire army. He's not the best fighter. His ranged ability is very limited, but the reality is he takes some of the best units that the Empire has, like the Huntsmen and the Archers early on, much earlier on. You're going to use Archers and you're going to switch into Huntsmen. He takes some of the best units that you want to use in any Imperial campaign. He, he makes them far cheaper for his army. And he gets a lot of units in his campaign that are really, really good. So an enormous amount... Uh, an enormous amount of power in this campaign, though it is annoying having to deal with the hostility meter. But still, I think at the moment, when you're looking at this campaign, you also have these heroes over here, these uh, legendary heroes. Yes, you get four legendary heroes. Yeah, imagine that. Well, they're not really what you could call legendary heroes. They're regular heroes that just have a couple of quests and... Uh, get a bunch of benefits in their campaign. Though they, they're not 
quite like seeing someone, someone like Orduz, but they certainly can get the job done as well. So Marcus does have a good amount of power in his campaign. It's just a crappy campaign because of this hostility, hostility meter. But who else is there? It's not Gelbdorf, Karl Franz, that's for damn certain, because Imperial Authority and the Empire itself is pretty crap. It's not Volkmar, because he's very weak early on. And while you can become the most powerful in the late game, late game power does not make a good campaign. That's something that a lot of people may not necessarily understand, but I wish to emphasize that just because a Legendary Lord may become more power, far more powerful in the late game, doesn't much matter if the first 30, 40, 50, 60 turns of your campaign on, are utter misery. And that's certainly the case, at least for the first 30 turns in Volkmar's campaign. Whereas in Marcus, you'll just be steamrolling every other faction. You're the only Imperial campaign where you could genuinely make that statement of steamrolling. Karl Franz and Gelt can't really do it. Unless you're counting the cheese that they can exploit with Nuln, but... How you count that in a ranking, you're basically saying that the campaign is so fucking broken and crap that you have to use something like that. And that's the case with Karl Franz and Gelt. For Grand Cafe, it is Yao Ming, the Iron Dragon. Not Miao Ying, who starts over here in Nangao. Why is that? Well, honestly, you have a better uh, starting province than Miao Ying. You start with a tier 2 settlement, even if it's a minor one, and... Right now, because of the changes that they implemented in this campaign, you can take Hayu Port on turn 1. No longer wasting time in your campaign. And you can expand much quicker as a result of that. You also have a unit of fire and rain rockets. Yes, the Sky John can be useful in situations, it has more ammunition, but I do prefer these grounded artillery um, in quite a few ways. Though there are some absolutely silly things you can do with the Sky Junk in, in, in a campaign. Faction wide effects, the reason he wins out, it's really the faction effects and the Lord effects. Um, you get plus 20% maximum cargo capacity for caravans, plus 5 hero recruit rank, minus 25% upkeep for ogre mercenary units, and 15 armor for melee units. It's really that 15 armor that makes it work. Cafe has some heavily armored units. You make them ridiculously uh, uh, ridiculously armored. Consider this. A Jade Warrior is a tier 1 unit. Hang on, chew on that for a moment. And it's as armored as many other units are at tier 3. That is absurd. And that's just by default. Then you make them as armored as cast warriors, more or less. That is insane. That is insane. And the extra cargo capacity for caravans also means that you can get a lot more money through those caravans in a campaign. I do like the Castorf caravan mechanic more than I like the Grand Cafe one because, hey, you can run multiple caravans, but hey, uh, you take what you can get. Then you get a minus 25% upkeep for melee units. Certainly we are in a melee meta situation in the game at the moment. You get a magic item drop chance plus 100%. And then special skill line you get desert armor, so that's an additional 10 armor for his army, 15% uh, missile strength, and 10% melee attack. When you add all of that together, it does start to get pretty absurd. Uh, then you get a benefit to lore of metal spells, diplomatic benefits to cafe and crucially the ogres, more upkeep benefits for ogre mercenaries, though you're not going to use ogre mercenaries, unfortunately. The system is broken, they really need to fix that. Construction cost in the local province, hero capacity and hero recruit rank for alchemists. And then you get regeneration, armor piercing damage, and armor piercing damage for his entire army. He is pretty absurd with melee units. Make an entire doom stack of terracotta sentinels, you're gonna kill everything in sight. And then he gets a choice. Over here between various skills that buff allies and range. I personally prefer piercing if I'm going to choose. Poison can obviously be good, or you can get uh, flaming attacks, which give you magical attacks, but probably piercing would be the one to go. Keep in mind, the alchemists also get a similar skill right here through, through, the, through, this, uh, through this skill line over here. But I do think piercing in general is, well, it's the go-to one because it's going to be useful in the most amount of situations. Like, compared to Miao Ying, I would say he's just a better lord. He buffs the current the playstyle that works the best currently in the game right now. Like when Warhammer 3 came out, it was certainly the opposite, but it was also the opposite for a different reason. It's a reason because the Great Bastion would start breached in Realms of Chaos, 
and Miao Ying couldn't handle that one controlled by the AI and would get wiped out. So you'd be running from halfway across the map in Cafe to have to deal with that. Wasn't a pleasant experience. But now in Immortal Empire Cell, even in Realms Accounts at the moment, Xiao Ming is the better legendary lord versus Miao Ying. I'm not saying Miao Ying is weak. I'm saying that Xiao Ming just is substantially better as a legendary lord. Your western flank is relatively secure. Yes, of course, may declare war on you, all that. Uh, but right now, given the, w the way things work in the game, it really isn't too big of an issue. You don't really have to worry too much about Gorst. And when it comes to Snitch, which is the main issue you might have to deal with in a uh, within a cafe and caravan, you actually uh, a campaign, sorry, uh, you can actually deal with Snitch easier than Miao Ying can deal with Snitch. The reason is you take how you port, you take Shen Wu, you take Shang Yang. You, you take the Shrine of the Alchemist and then finally you take Taizu. And then you're just going to be within striking distance of Sing Po, which is going to be Snitch's starting settlement. So, and it's going to be vulnerable. You take out Sing Po with Snitch, which Mao Ying can't just walk up to do. You do so, you really hurt uh, Snitch. And then you can deal with everything else that he has. And after that, well, it's really up to you what you want to do in your campaign. You have a lot of uh, choices. C uh, cafe and cam uh, campaigns though can be pretty limited because of the terrain types that they have access to unfortunately because you only have temperate savanna and desert and while that obviously works in cafe itself it doesn't necessarily work outside of cafe because there there's a huge distance to cover if you want to end up uh, going for other territory that is a shame i i think like a cafe and campaign is the kind of thing you would play with the uh, climate mod to eliminate uh, climate in general uh, or the climate penalties in general though i wish creative assembly would embrace that concept themselves getting to the greenskins it is of course grimgore ironhide a lot of people have talked about grimgore since the forge of the cast or if has come out actually he was already very substantial when warhammer free immortal empires came out and people were kind of hoping that the forge of the cast dwarves were was going to weaken him and made them stronger. But let's look at Grimgore. Let's talk about his faction effects, his lord effects, and what makes him so OP. Faction effects wise, he gets here recruitment of Black Orc big bosses in all provinces. Waz have a chance to contain Black Orcs, which are some of the best units of the Greenskins. He takes 10 he gets 10% campaign movement range for all armies, and he gets an upkeep benefit for Black Orcs and Big Guns, which in itself is all pretty good. So you can maintain some of the best units of the green greenskins cheaper uh, than the other legendary lords can, with the exception of Grom. But Grom is uh, well, Grom has his issues in his campaign, though he though Grom technically has better lord effects. Grimgore just has a much much better campaign. Uh, looking at his special skill line, or rather his lord effects, he gets thirty percent post battle loot, armor benefits, and leadership benefits for black orcs. And he gets the ability or next, which makes it an absolute killing machine in a duel. It doesn't matter if the person he's doing has much better stats. The fact that he gets this ability makes him an absolute nightmare to win against in a duel. As any legendary lord in the game. You can take Malice Darkblade against Grimoire. And while Malice Darkblade would win, he would have a fight on his hands. He also gets the Immortals banner, which really takes a unit of, immor uh, of Black Orcs and makes them immortal as you might imagine. A special skill line, he gets hero capacity plus two for black orc big bosses. He gets best of the best for melee defense and damage resistance, so even better as a duelist. He gets armor piercing damage and charge bonus for black orcs. Leadership and bonus versus large. Causes fear and terror. Gets an HP advantage and also gets the frenzy ability. In fact, I Pretty much thing like with this entire special skill line, Grimgore is the best duelist in the game. I mean, granted, he doesn't have regeneration, but damn, the amount of damage this guy can do in a battle and the amount of resistance he also has in a battle makes him pretty crazy. Then he gets two items, both of which are very good items, because he can do an explosion. You can't tarp it, Grimgore, once he gets the Blood Forge armor, because he's just going to walk out of it. No problem. So Grimgore has a lot of things going for him in terms of action effects and lord effects. There's a reason why when Immortal Empires came out, he was so powerful. But on top of that, 
he greatly benefits from his new and improved starting position. So he starts in a minor settlement at tier 2. That means within 2 turns he can recruit nasty skulkers, that means within 3 turns he can recruit trolls. Now you add trolls and nasty skulkers together, and you get one of the best early game armies that any Ledger and Lord can get, with the exception of like Wood Elves and Warriors of Chaos. But it's still a really good army, and it's not just going to be one army, it's going to be a dozen armies very quickly. That isn't an exaggeration. He starts in a good province with four settlements, controlled by most of it controlled by a minor ogre faction that's just gonna collapse under Grimgor's assault. And he has no real natural rival with the exception of Kolik, and you can avoid fighting Kolik for much of your early campaign, though eventually you probably will end up having to fight Kolik. He also has a landmark in his starting province over here, which is the big fort that gives you a further upkeep and recruitment cost benefit for black orc units, recruit rank uh, for black orc units uh, in all provinces, uh, plus two or plus three in this province and recruitment duration of minus one, which means you can recruit them in one turn. Furthermore, he has the ability of taking a tier five settlement pretty quickly in his campaign. People have done it on turn five, people have done it on turn two. I can do it at turn 11 without relying on the bullshit cheeses some people do. Because what people will do, is the way they'll play this particular battle in Zarnagrin is they'll use nasty skulkers to take the capture point or they'll have a reinforcement army spawning next to the capture point that's only going to last until the creative assembly fixes it and that's how they eliminate the garrison dwarf the crawl's army leaving all the syra and his army to contend with which is something that a lot of people might lose against if you're not cheesing, you can take the settlement by, let's say, turn 11 or so, in a proper manner. By proper manner, you have, I mean you actually defeat oh, these endgame armies that the Chaos Dwarfs start over here in Zarna Grund. That is how powerful Grimgor is. You can cheese and win this very quickly, or you can spend, uh, spend a couple more turns and win it quote-unquote properly. Or defeating the army and laying siege to the settlement, and then defeating the garrison uh, one way or another. Or unleashing the cheese at that point and spawning the reinforcements or just winning the siege battle one way or another. So there is a ridiculous level of power that Grimgor has. Because getting a settlement that can be tier 4, some people have gotten it to tier 5, I admit I'm a bit, I find that a bit odd. I guess it's a bit of a bug. Not entirely certain about that. Um, but you can certainly take this Zarnagur in this tier 4. And that means you get all the hero capacity and virtually all of the unit recruitment options in your campaign with the exception of the rogue idol and you're going to be able to get it to tier 5 anyway because greens can have good growth and then well no one can stand in your way on top of that because you can take Narzarna Grun, and this is the reason i like to wait as opposed to taking it as quickly as possible because it's not like gore for Syra is are going to get more powerful as you wait Maybe if they were building a Mega Mortar, and even then, I, mean, I wouldn't be entirely certain that would benefit them as much as you might think. Um, the benefit in waiting is that you can then declare a Wa on Zarna Grund. And declaring a Wa on Zarna Grund means you're getting a major construction cost benefit at, if you do that Wa. That makes Grimgor even more absurd. And after that, no one will stop you. No one can stop you. That isn't an exaggeration. You're stronger than everyone else around you. Even if you don't take Zarnagrund early in your campaign, you are still the top dog over here. You're stronger than Astrogoth, you're stronger than Zaytan, you're stronger than, uh, than Kolik. That is how ridiculous Grimgor is in his campaign. And it's very appropriate for his character in the lore, because, well, in the lore he didn't fight Kolik, but he absolutely trashed, um, uh, trashed the Chaos Dwarves. Well, Astrogoth got betrayed, and, well, Zaytan just get, got killed. He also killed, and uh, Grimgor also killed Drazef in the lore. He, his conquest of the Darklands started with the Black Fortress. He united the Ogres and Greenskins under his banner, and then the Hop and then he annihilated the Black Fortress. At that point, the Hobgoblins were like, yeah, we're going to pick the winning side, and they did. And they opened the gates to Zarnagrund, and, well, the outcome was inevitable. Grimgor is inevitable. Questine here, signing out. Don't forget to subscribe, like, enable notifications, and stay tuned for more.